This season of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly brought to you by Casio Electronic Music Instruments. So what I try to do in these workshops is to show how creativity can be integrated right in the lesson. You know, this idea that if a student is learning Wild Rider by Schumann, that there could be some kind of improvisation activity directly tied to that that would first result in improvisation and kind of their own fantasia on Wild Rider as we talk about different elements that are in the piece, but then maybe a, a possible composition. As I said before, how a how repertoire influenced my young compositions, Schumann can influence the students to improvise and then maybe turn it into their own wild writer that they could submit. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. Good day, everyone. Welcome back to Season 1, 2018 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. You're listening to Episode Number 2. And if you're one of my Inner Circle Piano Teaching Community members, a special welcome to you. My name is Tim Topham, your host for the show. And if this is your first time here, thank you very, very much for tuning in. I really hope you enjoy today's conversation and tell everyone you know about it. For those of you who have been listening for a while, thanks again, of course, for choosing to spend time with me again. The Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is the place where you can get weekly inspiration, ideas, business and teaching strategies to help support your teaching and grow your studio. Today's show notes and a full transcript are available now at the address timtopham.com slash episode 118. As part of the 2018 podcast seasons, I'm planning to release a number of composer spotlights, which are just conversations with some of your most cherished composers about their background, teaching, and thoughts on creativity and composition. In the last couple of years, I've already spoken to a number of composers, and so make sure you check back on these if you haven't checked them out before. Daniel McFarlane from Supersonics Piano is in episode one. I spoke to Christopher Norton in episode number two. Irina Gurin of Tales of a Musical Journey uh, had a great conversation with her in episode 62. The fantastic Dennis Alexander came on and actually played a whole lot of music live for us on that episode number 64. Carol Matz was featured in episode 89 and Pamela Wedgwood in episode 99. To name just a few, there are a number of others as well. So to check any of those out, remember that you can just grab my app on iPhone or Google Play and easily listen to any of the episodes. Just search in your app store for Tim Topham and uh, that's a great way to be able to check these out. You can, of course, always head to your favorite browser and just type the show name, timtopham.com, uh, slash episode 89 or episode 64. And that's the easiest way to find links and the show notes. My guest today is an active pianist, composer, and member of the piano faculty at Utah State University, where he teaches piano literature, pedagogy, and accompanying. In addition to his collegiate teaching responsibilities, he directs the Utah State University Youth Conservatory, which provides weekly group and piano, private piano instruction to more than 200 pre-college community students. A native of Utah, my guest began composing at age five, would you believe it? When he was 12, his composition, called An American Train Ride, received the overall first prize at the 1983 National Parent Teacher Association Convention in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He maintains a large piano studio, teaching students of a variety of ages and abilities. Many of the needs of his own piano students have inspired more than 100 books and solos published by the FJH Music Company, which he joined as a writer in 1994. Can anyone guess who it is? Of course, it is the wonderful Kevin Olson. Welcome to the show today. Thanks for having me, Tim. I'm so excited to finally be on uh, on the show. It's going to be fun. Yeah, it's great. We were talking just a moment ago about how we uh, we met face-to-face about two years ago, and I said... Kevin, you're coming on my podcast and uh, here we are. It's taken a little while, but I'm glad to have you on the show. So you began composing at age five, apparently. Now that sounds incredibly Mm -hmm. early to me. What what do you think was your initial inspiration? Well, I guess for me, it never felt like I was doing anything different. It was always very natural for me. My mom is a piano teacher. And so I I was doing the traditional lessons. But for me, I just never, ever separated this idea of – 
playing literature from creating. And so it was something I was doing from a young age. She would help me notate my music probably until I was about second or third grade. And then we would be working toward these competitions uh, that I could submit and get little trophies, ribbons, you know, the kind of things that seven and eight year olds just get excited about. So I had enough extrinsic motivation to kind of keep lots of new pieces coming. And, and it, it, it was fun. It was, it was really kind of an exciting thing that gave me a sense of identity as a musician early on. Right. So do you think it came from yourself or did your mother as your teacher really say, okay, well, let's, um, let's pull this piece apart and uh, why don't we try playing some chords now and things like that? Or, or did it come out, somehow just come out of you? Yeah, I think some kids, it's very natural. I think that I've got, a, I've got several in my studio that are the previous the, that you were talking about earlier where you know, they, they get excited when you can kind of give them a project or they can see how it might relate to their literature. But in my case, it was always a very natural thing. It was just something that, you know, some parents would call it goofing off at the piano. It was just this kind of improvisation, making things up. And I, I, I was just always drawn to that element. And there never seemed to be a, a kind of a, a forced or an extrinsic um, motivation for any of that. Right. Yeah. So can you remember your first composition? What, what was it like? <laughs> it was terrible. I'll tell you that. Yeah. My mom, luckily, I mean, again, as my mom, the piano teacher, thank goodness, uh, kept an archive of all these little pieces. Oh, and wow. she, she has one from when I was just going into first grade and it has the very profound title of Dance of the Baby Bullfrogs. And so <laughs> it's got this like little wrong note, uh, C major. So even early on, I was really into dissonance and quirkiness and doing things against the grain without, you know, so I, no one told me that it was illegal to do that yet. That's know? great. And, and did, did those early compositions tend to mimic things that you were learning, uh, written pieces you were learning in your lessons? Absolutely. It's funny to go back and listen to. For example, I wrote uh, a piano concerto when I was in high school. And the first movement movement is just the biggest Grieg ripoff you've ever heard. Right. And then <laughs> big descending then chords. Like this, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I had the big epic, you know, minor thing going on, and a lot of the same textures and stuff like that. So, so I think that's always been an influence. Is is what you know, a, an artist or a composer that's really interested in me at the time. So when I go back and look at student works, that's always kind of fun because I can think, even if I wasn't intentionally doing it, I can even remember the pieces that were inspiring these right. compositions. Yeah. I might come back to that uh, concerto because I've got a question about that. But uh, I just want to yeah. stay with you in your early life. Uh, tell us about sure. the National Parent Teacher Association Convention Competition. That's a mouthful. Yeah. Uh, which you won <laughs> age 12. How did that all work? What, what were you expected to do? Yeah. So in the United States, the PTA is one of these kind of uh, parent volunteer groups where there's kind of this interaction between parents and teachers and they put on socials and do fundraising and things like that. And they have sponsored organizations all around the country. And so one of the things they do is they sponsor what's called the reflections contest. And I think they've been doing it for 40 or 50 years. And so every year they, they put a call out, there's a theme and they put a call out for poetry and visual art music. I think they've even expanded it to like, uh, you know, video of like, creative interpretive dance and all sorts of different things like that. And so you enter at your school level and then it goes to the district and it goes to state and region and so on. And so every year I would enter and it would be fun to kind of see how far I would get. Usually it'd end up about maybe region or state or something like that. Um, so when I was in sixth grade, I was at my grandparents' house. My parents would send me up there to teach me how to work. So they'd send me to the farm, let me just kind of learn how to be a, a farm kid for the summer. And so I was up there and evidently the PTA was trying to track me down because I had been a national winner. And they finally found me at my grandparents' house and they said, you've got to get here in about a couple of weeks. Here, we need to get you on a plane, get you down to the conference. And so you can perform your piece. It was the first time I'd ever been on an airplane. And as I was telling you earlier, President Reagan was at that one that year. So it was it was in Albuquerque, which I'd never been to. So it was a really cool thing for a, a little sixth grader to be with his parents and kind of treated like a VIP for uh, for a composition. Absolutely. It would have been huge, I'm sure. Do you what what do you think about the the idea of competitions uh, for composers. I've, I've never been too sure about 
mm-hmm. whether compositions for performers are actually a good thing or a bad thing. I can I think there's certainly destructive elements yeah, as well as absolutely. the good. What about for right. composers? Is there that same element or is it a great way to encourage our students? Yeah, I think it's much less pressure if you kind of think about submitting stuff off to a competition. I mean, this is stuff I tell my students that composers do all the time anyway. When there are calls for scores or a publisher ask you for certain things, you put the music out there and then you kind of forget about it. And then you see what happens. And so with my composition students, we're submitting stuff to competitions all the time. And it's not this devastating experience when they don't hear anything back. There's always you know, there's judges feedback and it's always usually very positive. And then when they do happen to win here and there, you're right. It's, it's absolutely huge for them. Mm. So to me, I feel like that, that, you know, it, it, if I don't have something that these kids, these composer kids are working towards some kind of goal, it usually doesn't happen. But if we know, for example, the national federation of music teachers, their composition at the state levels due on February 1st. If we know when the PTA is going to be going on, MTNA has these composition things. It's fantastic. And uh, the kids get things ready. They send them off. There's always encouraging feedback. But I, I felt the same way with um, with performance. And so I see where you're coming from with that because it's such high pressure. You're on the stage and you're seeing the other kids. And But in composing, I think it's a lot different. Mm. Vibe. And so just as sort of exams could be a way of testing a performer, uh, these mm-hmm. competitions could be a great uh, great way of uh, you know encouraging the progression towards a, a desired end for exactly. a composition student because that is often a difficult thing. I love encouraging composition in my students as I'm sure you do. Uh, mm-hmm. but how do you sort of make it complete if they're not going to yes. perform that composition? Uh, so Absolutely. we can we can notate it. We could upload a performance to YouTube and things. But here's another opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. there are a lot of these competitions around, I'm sure. Absolutely. So, you know, just a simple Google search where you look up uh, uh, student composers call for scores, for example, there'll be all sorts of different opportunities for these kids. And what's kind of fun about them is that Sometimes there's different parameters. So there might be something sponsored by a string, a string quartet, something. So, you know, the, the students may have never had an experience writing chamber music. So, you know, that's what also encouraged me as a young artist. That was actually, and we'll probably get into this, my foray into publishing was actually through a competition that was, that was the National the Conference on Keyboard Pedagogy. Which mm-hmm. Of course, you know, the Richard mm-hmm. Cronister, the Francis Clarks. And so they were doing something for that at the college level. And the the prize for that was getting two pieces uh, published by a publisher. FJ just happened to be one of the publishers there, and you know the rest is history. So it also opens up a lot of doors. People get to know your works, and then even if you don't win, someone may have heard that, and then you get opportunities in other places. So right. I like planting those seeds, mm. you know, with students. So yeah. just, just going back to that uh, competition uh, experience that you had as a 12-year-old flying around mm-hmm. the world, well, not around the world, around the <laughs> yeah. country, uh, yeah. and being treated like a VIP. Apart from that, how else did that win impact on your decision to become a composer later in life? Well, you know, I think you know, especially um, that being that age as a musician, it's it's tough. I mean, it's tough anyway, but I think especially for boys. I mean, I just think in in the arts – this idea of developing a sense of self-esteem when music isn't really the coolest thing for a sixth or seventh or eighth grade boy to be doing. I think sometimes that external motivation, you know, for me, it really came from two different aspects. My sense of self-esteem as a musician came from, you know, recognition at the school level. They would often announce things. And, you know, so my friends would know if I'd won competitions and stuff like that. And it also came from, um, this sense, well, the other area was through jazz. And so for me, I was the kid that could play, you know, um, Linus and Lucy, Pink Panther, the, you know, or some of the rock music, you know, uh, Journey or, you know, Guns N' Roses or whatever they wanted me to play. And so when I had those two things that were really motivating me as a musician, that's where my self-esteem came from. I could, I could hang around with my friends who were really great athletes or top students in school and I had an identity as a musician. And I think it's really important at that age that kids and especially I think boys really start to feel that someone is appreciating this or it's, it's, there's some kind of cool aspect to it. Right. Yeah. It's, it's one reason why I'm very passionate about empowering teachers to help students uh, and, and particularly boys, as you say, to give them some uh, things that they can play that people know 
and that people are going to go, oh, wow, how cool is this kid? Uh, and their friends are going to think the same thing as well because that is the thing that gives that sense of self-esteem and will keep them practicing a bit more, even if Absolutely. it is the opening riff to a journey song that everyone knows, <laughs> yeah. right? That's no, crucial. You're, you're exactly right. And, you know, we're light years ahead of where where I was at that age when I was taking piano in the 80s and there really wasn't as much pedagogic, uh, pedagogical uh, arrangements and things that, that, you know, even I would, I would still snap anything up that I could get. But today, boy, you can find all sorts of uh, arrangements or movie themes or whatever the students are interested in that are really well arranged that can, t- can tie into the other things they're doing. We do classical all the time, but especially in my studio probably is about maybe 70 or 75% boys. We really do try to find ways that we can tie in some of those interesting kind of cool pieces into the other things they're doing. Right. Yeah. Great, uh, great tactic. Well, tell us a little bit more about your teaching and lecturing and your composing today. What's a week in the life of Kevin Olson look like <laughs> these days? Well, as you probably know, the week in the life of any musician is very, uh, it's very schizophrenic, isn't it? I mean, so, <laughs> Varied, yeah. so I am on the, I'm on the piano faculty here at Utah State. And so as part of the piano faculty, I'm teaching courses in things like, uh, piano literature. This semester we're focusing in on, well, we started with Beethoven and we'll move all the way to Liszt. And then uh, I'm te- I, I teach pedagogy. We're doing a, a graduate uh, Schenker analysis class. And so I have these classes that I'm working with. I've got my piano majors who are getting ready for juries and recitals and things like that. So college students. And then in the afternoon is when I teach the kids. So I have about usually between about 15 and 20 kids coming each week mostly between maybe early intermediate and really kind of getting ready for college auditions and things like that. Most, I think most of my students are between the ages of 11 and 18 or so that are coming in the afternoons. I'm doing a lot of composing still. There's always work to be done, sending stuff to FGH and we'll talk about the music club that I've started Mm. uh, that keeps me composing and that. So I was just doing that this morning. I'll also get outside jobs too. So there are local, um, groups that are asking me to orchestrate or reduce. I just had to take two orchestral reductions and reduce them down for a two piano um, arrangement for a concert coming up in a couple of weeks. So so those outside jobs come in and, and keep me busy. And then I do a little bit of jazz. So I'm on our faculty jazz combo and uh, play gigs here and there, weddings and and other kind of random things. Wow! So. Yeah, a, a truly um, multi-skilled and uh, <laughs> ve- you know multi-varied. I can't remember the term I'm trying to think of for for a career. It's yeah, you know, it, it is well, the the career of a musician, isn't it? Yeah, it absolutely. And it you know it's it's wonderful because every day is different. I mean, my accountant hates me because there's so much money coming in different places and trying yeah, to figure out makes taxes. It a pain, it's right? a night. It's a yeah. nightmare, as I'm sure you know. But yeah. it's uh, but it does keep your days really interesting. Yeah. You know? So yeah. what do you think are some of the most important things piano teachers can be doing in their lessons to encourage more Kevin Olsons to come out of their studios? <laughs> well, you're preaching to the choir. Just your question there is because I go around the country and uh, do workshops at uh, national and state conferences. And one of the things I talk about is really the research is showing that we really do have a, a crisis in creativity. And, the, and the, the data is showing that these kids are – smarter intellectually the iq scores are going up but there are tests like the torrens test that comes out and i show data that actually literally shows that kids today aren't thinking as creatively they're not able to form creative thoughts uh work in graphic um visual representations of creativity even as recent as like the 1990s and so you know we can track a lot of that to two things it's really Of course, the advancement of technology and everything being programmed for kids today. And the second thing really is, and I don't know what the situation is in Australia, but the the, the common core structured teaching to the test stress that teachers have during the the, the random school day. So things like the arts, there's a whole debate in the state of Utah right now about arts uh, becoming just an extracurricular activity and really taking the, the budget away from that. And so... We've had faculty at Utah State go down and just they're 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 lobbying and working with our legislature to just keep just arts in the school. That's the kind of uh, struggles that we're having. And so I feel like there's more and more of an uh, of an importance that we have as private instructors to foster this kind of creativity because kids aren't getting it in many other places. Right. And so, yeah, I think, you know, I think teachers get a little 
overwhelmed by this idea. I mean, we have exams, we have recitals and festivals we have to get ready. And so what I try to do in these workshops is to show how creativity can be integrated right in the lesson. You know, this idea that if a student is learning Wild Rider by Schumann, that there could be some kind of improvisation activity directly tied to that, that would first result in improvisation and kind of their own fantasia on Wild Rider as we talk about different elements that are in the piece, but then maybe a, a possible composition. As I said before, how a how repertoire influenced my young compositions, Schumann can influence the students to improvise and then maybe turn it into their own wild rider that they could uh, submit. Right. So taking, for you, taking elements of pieces, pulling them apart, uh, exploring uh, ideas around composition in a pieces that students are learning is is one tactic that you give teachers? Absolutely. And right. then as we've talked about before, these other extra opportunities where students can enter competitions. I just got finished judging, oh, there were probably, oh, several dozen uh, uh, composition entries for the guild. And so I was one of the judges there. And how inspiring to see these teachers that are getting these students to, to come up with beautiful uh, compositions, not only just orally, but they're encouraged to do cover art and to come up with titles that some had very elaborate stories behind them. That gives me hope that there are teachers that are really fostering creativity in a time when they're not getting it in other places. Right. And what would you say to teachers listening who are still just just starting to think about the fact that they would like to be a little bit more creative with their students and encourage this, but not really sure where to start. Have you got just a couple of little easy sure. ins? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I would say, and you would probably agree with this, that, that, you know, we can't lump improvisation and, co and composition in the same category. Improvisation, I think all students can improvise. I think having the discipline to write those ideas, to get to that double bar line, to submit things, that takes a lot more work. And it's a little, and it's very time intensive for students and teachers. I've got several students that come to me just for composition lessons. So I think the teachers that get overwhelmed might be trying to do a little bit too much at the beginning. I think that, you know, if, if in, in a really kind of crude way, you could say that uh, improvisation is the the gateway drug. You know, it's the thing that gets you started to kind of get get your juices flowing. You get excited about it, and then as they get some external encouragement, you should say, "Man, I love that improvisation. We should write that down. That could be the next step with that." So I think for students that are or teachers that are just starting, that would be where I would start. Is I would take a look at the repertoire they're playing. And if they're learning a little piece that's focused in on a D major scale, for example, with an ostinato pattern, the teacher could play that ostinato pa pattern while the student improvises over a D major scale and comes up with their own versions of it. There are so many, I think there's so many benefits because, of course, now students are looking under the hood of their piece. They're not just playing start to finish and, oh, do I get a sticker now? But they're actually seeing, okay, what are the materials that actually put this piece together? What, what makes it? tick and can I come up with something similar to that so I would say the first step for any teacher is to look at the repertoire students are playing if, if it's as simple as a pentascale piece could they start to make something up and you're really talking about just an extra few minutes in a lesson this doesn't have to take over a lesson it really it can be a very simple process and I think momentum will will kick in after that Right. Well, look, I, you know, we're, we're peas in a pod in, in that regard. I, uh -huh. I fully agree. Uh, I like the definition or the, the separation you've mentioned between improv and composition and the fact that uh, I think some teachers may think, oh, when, I've, when I'm doing something creative, it's got to be a composition. They've got to notate it and submit it and mm -hmm. perform it. And I just say, no, 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 that's no. that's that's the that might be an end. But improvising, right. just mucking around, that's where you can – do it easily and kids can have fun and you don't have to prepare for it. Um, yeah, <laughs> so that's, that's absolutely. the great thing. And it, it, can, it can branch off in so many different levels. You know, as I said, I play with a lot of jazz musicians who I think are brilliant composers, but they've never written anything down. You know, they're not interested in, in having something that's, that's final and finished and perfect. And so if improvisation leads them into a life either in jazz or even just being, that's the other thing I try to explain to teachers that just think that improvisation equals jazz. Improvisation is the big umbrella. Jazz is just one aspect. So if a kid wants to improvise on sacred music and they're really into hymns at church, for example, or, or they, they really love a band or some kind of movie theme or something like that, to me, improvisation is such a big aspect. To me, that is something that all students should be able to do. 
And then those that want to have this crystallized final product that, uh, and I, I'm in that category. I love to have finished products that I can go back to and archive. That's great. But all kids and even adults aren't necessarily in that category. I completely agree with you. Now, a quick word from our sponsor, Casio Electronic Music Instruments. As many of you will know, if you've been listening to the podcast for any length of time, I've been trialing out the Selviano Grand Hybrid Piano in my studio, and uh, it's now become my main teaching and my own practicing instrument, and I've got to say that I'm thoroughly enjoying using it. Uh, of course, many of you will know the benefits of a hybrid piano, uh, including things like uh, the recording functions you've got, the choice of different sounds, the fact that students or yourself, you can wear headphones while you're using it, you don't need to pay removalists to move it around your studio or house, and the fact that it never needs tuning and obviously limited maintenance so they're all fantastic but how does it actually sound and feel to play well pretty amazing uh, and I really I'm not a concert pianist so to me this is absolutely as good as a full length normal acoustic grand piano uh, and it does have all the wooden keys and the normal mechanism you'd expect so what I would really recommend you do is head to soundtechnology.com.au to find out where your local stockists of this instrument are and uh, go and test one out today I really believe that you'll find not only is it a fantastic instrument but it's also at a price point that really sets it apart from its competitors. Now, you've got a big catalogue of, of works and are continuing to make music today, as you've just said. Before I tell you some of the pieces I like, what are your top three favourite compositions <laughs> that you've written? I know this is a hard one. I know it is. A, it really is hard. You know, I when I get asked that question, you know, the real answer that I want to say is my favorite piece is the next one I'm going to write. You know, <laughs> it's the one that is kind of out there that I'm going to strive to, but I know that's not a very good answer. And the next one's probably not quite as good either, but it's really true. And that is really my last compositions end up being the ones that I'm the most excited about because I think we evolve as artists. Maybe you felt that in certain aspects of, you know, things that you archive, maybe going back and listening to your first couple of podcasts or oh, maybe, maybe it's not maybe yeah. it's a painful experience, but it's Absolutely. kind of like, and it's, it's the same way with compositions. It's kind of like going back and looking at your, your journal or diary entries when you're a teenager, you're like, I can't believe that that is me, but it sure feels like a whole different person there. I love it. I mean, I'm certainly not going to be Brahms and whitewash everything I, I, and get rid of anything I've written before the age of 20. I think there's something really valuable to looking at student works and to, if for no other reason, just, you know, to remember who I was at that age, but I'm certainly not as proud of the older things as I am with the most recent. So things that are just really recent that are a lot of fun. One thing, um, I've got things in the works at FGH that are pretty exciting. I've got a, a new um, uh, series that's like the My Kind of Music series called Imaginations that'll be coming out, a five-book series that have all been written in the last year or two, and it's just been a ball to put together. Um, I got a brand new piano quartet. So the Wyoming music teachers asked me to write something that was kind of cowboy related. So that'll be premiering at MTNA in Orlando. And so me and three other collegiate colleagues will be using that as a closer for the FGH showcase. So there's things that are, that are really kind of exciting to me that are recent. And the other things I, I look back as more of kind of, as you would look at it, you know, some kind of museum or or interesting kind of zoo of my piece and and you know but uh, but that's kind of where I'm at with with some of the most the things that really resonate with me or the things I'm yeah. doing right now. Are you going to be yeah. channeling a bit of Aaron Copeland in your cowboy composition? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not nearly that sophisticated. It's right. a lot more <laughs> down, fun, just over the top. So I wish it was. I wish it was even in the same zip code as Aaron Copeland. <laughs> No, I, I have to ask you quickly. I've always wondered when it comes to a, a, a composer writing a concerto, uh, you're composing not only something that's often quite difficult for one instrument, the piano, which is hard enough to write for, but you've got to write a full. You've got to write parts for every part of the orchestra. How? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How on earth do you do it? Like, I, it's just beyond me that uh, people can do this. Where do you oh, even start is. with that? <laughs> and that's where that's what's so fun about composition is that there's always that next challenge. So when I was, you know, a young teenager, I was uh, starting to write chamber music. I had friends that were playing in groups, and then I joined the jazz band, and so I would write tunes for our jazz band to play in high school. And then, then that got me excited. The orchestra teacher came and talked to me. And so 
you know, it's just one of those things that you jump off the ledge when you get that, uh, that challenge and you kind of learn as you do it. You know, people ask about, you know, what are the good composition textbooks? What about orchestration textbooks? And my answer is always, I've always learned from scores. I mean, I just feel like I can learn a lot more by going to the library and checking out, you know, a Grieg or Tchaikovsky or Mendelssohn piano concerto and seeing, you know, where those sounds are coming from than to just to read a dusty textbook about it. So that's, that's where, and then it continues through college. I was just voracious with scores and I got into contemporary music. I, I didn't really have a lot of experience writing really kind of contemporary avant-garde kind of things. Didn't even know it existed really until college. And then I got really excited about, you know, looking for, so I still have, you know, I've got Stravinsky's Rite of Spring score. I've got a lot of Debussy scores. I've got Bartok. I've got other, and I, I've tried to learn techniques from all of the different music, whether it's piano solo or chamber orchestral. And I think you can learn a lot from just looking at what people have done. Yeah, so that's great. My favorite pieces of yours are by uh, are the My Kind of Music series. You've, you've mentioned them already. Books one, three, and four, totally love. Uh, have they been popular? Yeah, they really have. I think that, um, you know, one thing that is kind of an interesting aspect that some people don't think about is the the challenges of writing pedagogically. I mean, I think that if I had my way, I'd write everything hard. You know, it's just, that's the stuff that gets me really, now that challenges me. I sit down and improvise and I do really hard kind of music, but really trying to, um, you know, write to a specific level, look for patterns, look for things that, that would be really engaging and interesting and not blah for a student to play that sound harder than they really are, that have patterns. It's, it's, it's taken a lot of years to do that. And when people come by and say, you know, I'd love you to look at pieces of mine because I think I could get into the educational publication business. That's usually the response that I have is that, you know, beautiful music, that's great. It's wonderful. But you really need to now start thinking about, you know, writing for a specific level, writing for things that would be teachable for and I think some of the best, you know, uh, one of my idols in the field is is um, Robert Vandal. I just mm. love Vandal's music because it's always really – it's interesting. It's a little edgy. It's sophisticated. But when you really break it down, it's often very simple to teach. Mm. And to me, that's that's a lot harder to do actually than writing some really beautiful epic type of piece. Yeah, well, I was going to say I, I enjoy them and my students do because they they sound modern. They sound kind of popular, pop-ish. Uh, and uh, and are a joy to listen to as well. And so I'm wondering if when it comes to these favorite works that we all have as teachers, uh, do you think they're often popular, most popular when they appeal to all three stakeholders of music education, which is students and the teachers, but also the parents who have to listen to these things played over and over again? Do you think that's important too? Absolutely. I love how you call them the, the, the three stakeholders. There really needs to be this triangular relationship and having everybody on the same page. There's nothing more motivating to me than repertoire. To me, it's the engine that keeps students going when everything else is difficult, when they're busy, when they have all these extracurricular and other things competing for their time. It's often the music that keeps them going. It was it was Linus and Lucy. It was Vince Guaraldi. It was Henry Mancini that kept me in piano when I was – when it maybe didn't seem like the coolest thing to do as a sixth or seventh or eighth grade boy. I was playing my Clementi and other things like that. But this stuff, this was the the energizer that kept keeps me going. And so if I feel like if I can be a part of that, if I turn my laptop around, you'd be able to see my wall, which is covered with – letters from students from around the country and around the world that say things like, I just really love your legend of Pirate Pete. It's the coolest piece ever signed whoever from Massachusetts. And I, I, I do it for them. It really, it keeps me motivated by just having these letters on my wall. Yeah. It must, must mean a lot as a composer to see that. And, and how great, good is it that people actually take the time to write in to you? I think it's I love fantastic. That. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So there's a little, little tick, uh, trick, trick, Tip, <laughs> a little yeah. tip for teachers around the world. Uh, composers love getting a little bit of feedback. So, and and yeah. now that we can connect with everyone online, uh, Facebook or wherever, I know Dennis, Dennis Alexander. I know rel- relatively well, and he's always on Facebook and, and <laughs> yes, loves nothing more right. than connecting over music. So, um, absolutely, yeah. Encourage teacher uh, students or you on their behalf to communicate with composers. I yeah. think it's it's great because we can do it these days. Yeah, and you know. 
composers, we're egomaniacs. We love to hear that our stuff is good. So when a student can say that, don't feel like you're wasting our time. I'll, I want I, I do respond to every email and everything that I get because I feel like that little connection that you can have with a living composer is so rare today. Mm. Students can feel like it's a living art, that we're not just in a museum playing all these dusty works from old European composers, but that this is something that's happening right around them and that they can be a part of the process too, making mm. up their own pieces. So a quick question on your composing. Do you tend to start with melody or harmony? Oh, well, I, th- I tend to think of composing as like each of these compositions is my, like individual kids, individual, like my own children, in the fact that they're all wired completely differently. Some, I can't write fast enough. They're just, they just come out and it's just so easy. Others, I just agonize and stress out about. Some of them start with, as you mentioned, just maybe a chord progression or a harmony, but others will be a tune or some kind of melody. Sometimes it's a concept. Sometimes it's a, or a, a title. Sometimes it's a, it's a commission. So like with Wyoming, you know, it being kind of known for the old, the Wild West and, uh, uh, you know, and it, it actually has its own, well, the university has a mascot named uh, Pistol Pete. And so I, <laughs> I, so I've got the Pistol Pete's piano posse rides again. And so that's exactly, that's that quartet I was talking about. So sometimes just a concept or a title can come first. And, and in many cases, it's just, um, you have to shift as a composer. Writer's block, I think happens when you're not able to be versatile in the way that you compose. So for example, if I'm sitting there stuck and nothing's coming, often I'll maybe start to improvise in a different key, or maybe I'll just uh, go over to a different instrument and just to see if, you know, if something could sound on a, on a different instrument on the digital piano or something like that. And so, you know, I think if you're versatile as a composer, music will always happen, even when those writer blocks happen, which they do all the time. I bet they do, yeah. Yeah. So uh, how did you come to be published by FJH? So I'm walking down the hall at my university. I'm a a freshman. I think I'm a sophomore at this point. And I see a a sign posted on one of the walls that said, uh, National National Conference on Keyboard Pedagogy Call for Scores. And they're looking for an intermediate level piece and an advanced piece. And they said, you know, the winners of these will be published. Um, and I'm thinking, man, I've got all these pieces kicking around. This would be an easy one to enter. So just that that philosophy I had from a, at a very young age of just sending my compositions off to, to different contests, I said, what the heck? So I sent two pieces off. And um, the interesting thing about that was that they were actually selected by Frederick Harris from Canada. Great relationship with everybody there at Frederick Harris, and they published the two pieces, a super big thrill. I got flown out to um, Chicago to perform this with six other college uh, winners. One of them, by the way, was Christo Cesaros, the, the, who publishes a lot for Alfred and teaches at Indiana, and of course. And um, Anyway, he was one of the winners there, and it was fantastic. And I kind of thought that was that. Well, it turns out that FJH was a brand new publishing company in the 90s. They were just getting off the ground. Piano Adventures wasn't even around yet. Uh-huh. And one of their editors, Vicki MacArthur, happened to be at the conference. And she went back to the CEO and said, hey, there's this kid that you ought to, to check out. And so I'm sitting in my theory class at at my university and my theory professor actually hands me this note saying, call this guy. He's interested in your compositions. So I call him and it's Frank Hackinson. He's got this really thick New York Brooklyn accent. He's like, (laughs) we'd love to publish all your music and all this kind of stuff. And it kind of sounded like the mafia. It sounded a little (laughs) like it wasn't legit, you know, and I'm thinking, well, I don't know, but against my better judgment, I sent him some pieces and it was the rest is history. It was about 20, 22 or 23 years ago. And I feel really blessed that I got off the ground really at the early days. It's hard to get into these publishers today. I mean, there's a lot of people that want to get things published. And I was just through really dumb luck as a college student, I got this opportunity through a composition contest. Well, I was going to ask if you had any advice for teachers or adult students perhaps who are listening who would like to get their compositions published. Any any tips about how to do it these days? Yeah. Times are different, well, I guess. Well, yeah. And I do think it, you're right. Times are different. I think publishers Really, I mean, it's it's an expensive proposition now, and so if they get a little bit of resistance from publishers, that's why is that it really, 
it's it's an investment for publishers where in the 90s there wasn't as much of a scene and so you really could kind of flood the market with a lot of original pieces with that said i i will say that there's also benefits in living in this time there are you know there are composers who are doing great things over the internet through blogs and um uh through you know pay as you go kind of sites and things like that i think that 20 years ago we were all kind of held hostage by the by the publishers. It was really hard to get in the scene if you weren't published. And of course, it was really expensive to get your stuff printed. And now with digital and PDF and other types of ways to transmit this stuff, people are finding ways to get their name out and um, and doing great things. And the best part is you get to keep 100% of your royalties. Right. You're not giving 90, <laughs> 90% back to a publisher. So it, yeah. I, I tell them, you know, there's a good and bad side to this. It is difficult to get in on the other hand, if you think outside the box and you're doing really creative things, you know, people are publishing all over and, and doing really well mm. with, uh, you know, with all of the capabilities we have today. So similar change from the uh, record industry, you know, record yeah. labels, everyone was hostage yeah. to record labels. Now they're almost trying to reach out to artists and say, come and come, come and work Absolutely. with us sort of thing. It's, it's completely flipped. And uh, having been on the other end of that, from the publishing standpoint, if I could give any feedback, because lots of people can come up with beautiful melodies and these rolling arpeggios and things like that, it really is to think pedagogically. It is to think about ways that you can write with a with a teaching focus as opposed to, I've got a lot of beautiful music I'd like you to publish. These educational publishers, really, the commercial aspect is going to come if you have pieces that are teachable and especially at the early levels. I think that we really get inundated from the publishing standpoint with intermediate, late intermediate, early advanced kind of pieces, which really don't sell as well as those beginning pieces. Mm. And that's the challenge. Can you write a really interesting beginning piece that you could teach easily to a first year student, maybe with an interesting teacher accompaniment, cute lyrics, great titles. If people can do that, then I think there's a lot more interest. And then you can build your um, foundation and then start to submit some of those more advanced pieces to publishers. Mm, great tips, Kevin. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right. Well, look, I think we'll start wrapping things up. I uh, did want to ask you about the Kevin Olson Music Club because this is something sure. that's emerged in the last what, couple of years mm -hmm. or has it been going for longer than that? No, just a, just the couple, last couple of years. And I think it's a perfect segue because I was feeling the same kind of frustrations that some of these teachers that want to get their pieces published were feeling. Even as a published composer, it takes so long to get your pieces published, sometimes several years to get things. So I, I was noticing things kind of sitting in the production pipeline and, you know, the production company has their – their process and things like that. So I was actually at an MTNA conference with my wife and she wakes up in the middle of the night. And she says, I've got the idea. How about if you start a subscription club where you're writing three pieces for teachers directly every month for a subscription fee? And there's a couple of really great things that happen with that. One is that I finally, I got motivation to compose. There's nothing like a good deadline to really make <laughs> you, you know, that's kind of how my students work too with compositions. They know they got to enter in this contest. They got to get something done. So I know at the end of every month, I've got to get three compositions written. And, and so that's one advantage too, is that they're going directly to teachers. So for a, for the subscription rate of $4.99 a month, they get this email on the first of every month saying, your three new pieces are ready. I write an elementary piece, an intermediate piece, an advanced piece. So just this morning, I finished up an advanced jazz ballad that um, that's, I had to have done by the end of Jan January. So, for example, this month, there's a, a, a little tiny uh, uh, elementary concerto for two pianos at the elementary level. There's a reggae-inspired intermediate piece. And then there's this jazz ballad. And so teachers are going to get that on um, on the 1st of February, and it goes direct. And FGH has been very kind in being able to publish those eventually. So I, I have the publication you know, venue for people, but otherwise – teachers are getting this music immediately, which has been fantastic. Oh, that's great. So you're able to sell them as part of your subscription, but uh, FJH kind of has first dibs on them if they want to put them in a book. Absolutely. Nice. Yes, and that's, oh, that's great. That I was talking about these imaginations, these five, this five-book series. A lot of those have come from the, the club. Oh, great. Because I was really feeling like I was losing momentum. I mean, when you write something and you're not sure if it will be published in the next couple of years, it's hard to get, a, as a composer, getting that uh, inspiration or motivation 
but now I'm kind of being forced to really and it's great and so a lot of compositions that probably wouldn't have ex existed otherwise through this club it's been wonderful oh that's great uh so that's at uh kevin olson music club dot com dot com exactly fantastic and, so, and there's a couple of free pieces of music that uh, teachers can go and just download just to see what they look like and if they're interested in joining the club as i said it's uh 495 american uh every month and uh, you just kind of forget about it, and then the, the music comes, and you can make as many copies for your students as you want to in your studio. Oh, great. So you studio own, license. You own, yeah, exactly. You've got the digital uh, copy there, and, and I don't have any problem with that. Brilliant. Oh, that's fantastic. So thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Yes. Now, is it, do you have a separate website for where people can find out about where you're giving workshops and things like that? I would say the best place to go would be the FJH workshop. Uh, work, the FJH site. The website, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, that's all right. <laughs> yeah, but the FJH website keeps track of the the different uh, state conferences. I do a lot of those, and I try to keep them updated on other things that I'm doing around right. the country. So, and what's the web so, address for them? Oh, you know, you have to you you have to go to fjhmusic.com, and then okay. it's I think it's there's a composer tab there. Brilliant. It's about composers. Yes. Cool. All right. And uh, you will be coming to MTNA in Florida as well in March. I will be there. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm excited. Looking yep, forward to hanging out. Yes, definitely. And you presenting as well? Yeah, well, there'll be the FJ Showcase, and I think that's the Sunday night, or sorry, Sunday morning, and I think that that's where they'll be doing the um, the quartet that I mentioned earlier as a closer, and there will be a couple of other new books that I'll be presenting with Helen Marley. Fantastic. Oh, I look forward to seeing you then. Uh, yeah. And uh, thanks again so much for your time today. It's been great to chat. Oh, absolutely. Let's, let's do this again sometime. All right. See you later. Thanks, Tim. All right. I really do hope you enjoyed that interview with Kevin Olson. Uh, I really enjoy always catching up with composers and finding out a little bit about their background and how they came to be doing what they're doing. But even more importantly, finding out their advice for other piano teachers in supporting creativity and composition. So uh, I, again, I hope you enjoyed that. Now, a few reminders before we sign off today. Firstly, I'm very, very excited that we are inching ever closer to the release of my roadmap for piano teachers. It's going to go live on the 15th of February, all going well. And this is a six-stage plan that links up every podcast, video, blog, article, anything that I've produced on these topics of creating a piano teaching studio, planning your business, uh, creating the actual business structures, teaching your first lessons, adapting your teaching, creating uh, next level growth by moving to groups and doing things like that, and then even the last stage onto pivoting to another business idea. This is going to go live on the 15th of February and uh, it, it's just it's taken a whole lot of work to put together but I know one of the things that uh, all teachers find difficult is the amount of information that's out there so what I wanted to do is help you hugely in that by actually putting it into a structured order and sequence that you can check off as you go so this is going to be part of uh, the features available inside my inner circle membership so if you're interested to uh, get on board, head to timtopham.com slash community and you'll be able to find out more about that. As many of you know, I'm heading to London next week and I'm very excited about that uh, for a number of speaking events and meetings. It's the first time I'll be over in London in my capacity as uh, my music, um, as a music speaker. So I'm really looking forward to that. Tomorrow, I'll be popping into the Piano Teachers course, the training weekend outside of London. So if you're on that course, then I certainly look forward to seeing you there. And then on Monday night, the 19th, we've got our meetup. So if you're based in London and you listen to this podcast and or you're a member of my inner circle, I would love to meet you. Head to timtopham.com slash meetup to find out when and where we're going to be having a few drinks uh, and getting to know each other a little bit better. And then finally, the big highlight of my trip to London, of course, is speaking at the Music Expo. It's next Thursday and Friday, the 22nd and 23rd of February. It's a free event at London Olympia. I'll be speaking on the Friday morning at 10.15 all about my approach to inspiring kids with four chord composing. So make sure you come along to that. Register if you need to. Um, I'm sure you'll be able to find the details online. So next week on the podcast, have you ever been frustrated that just when your student is ready for an exam, there doesn't seem to be any exam sessions available? 
For most exam boards, you have to book your students in two to three months ahead of time, which can be a real struggle when your students are dragging their feet and seem to be making no progress. My guest next week has solved this problem for teachers around the world through a new paradigm of music exams that leverage the power of the internet. I'll tell you all about that next week. I'm Tim Topham, and this is the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next week. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.